All right, welcome to ECE 165. This is an online video lecture. Uh, in this case, we are going to be discussing an introduction to layout. So what do we mean by layout? Well, when we're working on our labs and our homeworks and so on and so forth, we draw what we call schematics. Um, now schematics are functional um, connections between transistors and maybe resistors and capacitors and so on and so forth. But this is only a pictorial description. This doesn't represent a physical circuit. Okay, so after we're done designing our schematic, the next step is to do the layout of the circuit. Uh, and the layout is essentially a uh, physical representation of what the circuit will actually look like when the semiconductor foundry will actually fabricate your chip. So we do this with uh, computer-aided design tools. Uh, effectively, what we do is we draw a bunch of polygons. Uh, these polygons represent uh, you know, the, the gate of the transistor, the source drain, the contact, the metallization between the transistors, and so on and so forth. Now, uh, of course, any real integrated circuit is, is built in a planar process, but you know it's a physical thing, so, so it's actually a three-dimensional object. Uh, it's a little difficult for us to design uh, things in 3D, uh, and so most of our layout tools, uh, we look at it in a 2D planar space, and we use color coding or shading or things like this to represent different functional layers in that layout. So this is an example of a uh, kind of three-dimensional cross-section of a uh, NMOS device. In this case, we have the, the, the source and drain regions uh, here and here. Uh, we have the gate on top, uh, and then we have metallization that kind of comes out from the, the source and the gate uh, and presumably gets connected to other devices. So this is what the physical uh, device actually looks like. Uh, if we were to have to draw this every time, that would get rather cumbersome uh, when we go and do our physical design, uh, or in other words, our layout. Uh, so what we typically do is we will break the layout into, um, as I mentioned, a two-dimensional drawing uh, where different colors or shading types will represent different layers. Okay, so in this drawing, we have a gate. Uh, it's represented by this uh, red uh, rectangle. Uh, the source and the drain regions are represented by the, the green rectangle angle and the contacts which contact the source in the drain region and then go up to metallization are represented by the yellow squares. So the key thing you need to know about layout is uh, when we do layout, we have to abide by a certain set of design rules. Okay, The design rules are really the interface between the circuit designer and the process engineer. Uh, the process can't build metal lines that are one nanometer away from each other typically, and so we need to sort of design guidelines or rules uh, in order to help the layout engineer uh, design something that the, the foundry uh, engineers or the process engineers are comfortable uh, and, and confident in making. Okay. Now, most of the time in, in, in modern uh, process design kits, our design rules are made in absolute dimensions. Uh, so for example, the design rules will say you can put metal uh, as close together as, you know, let's say one micron apart from each other. Now, this is what we will use in this class. This is essentially universally used in most modern uh, process design kits. Um, Back, uh, you know, in, in the older designs like 0.25 micron, 0.35 micron, some of these design kits had uh, what they called scalable design rules. Uh, effectively, the design rules were fairly simple back then and uh, scaled fairly easily between different technology nodes. So we basically just said, okay, there's some unit uh, length lambda, whatever that is, it, it will depend on the actual process technology, but all, all of our rules are derived from that unit length. Okay, so we don't really use this anymore. We, we, we tend to use absolute dimension rules, uh, and so that's what we'll focus on in this class. So here's some design rules. Um, you know, if we have a, a, an N well that's creating a, a PMOS transistor, for example, if the wells are biased to the same potential, maybe they can be, uh, you know, six micron apart. If they're biased to different potentials, maybe they have to be nine mi microns apart. OK, um, you know, polysilicon, there's a minimum width uh, to the polysilicon device and a minimum spacing uh, that we have to have the poly uh, devices uh, away from each other. Polysilicon, by the way, is, is what typically comprises the gate of the transistor. 
Uh, we have ver various different metal layers. They also have spacing rules. Typically, the lower metal layers, like M1, uh, metal one, which is closest to the gate, has a tighter pitch, uh, tighter uh, design rules. Metals two, three, four, five, as you go up the metal stack, they tend to have slightly um, wider design rules. So here's an example of a design rule that's actually extracted directly from the process design kit that we're using. Uh, so for example, it says the minimum width of the poly, I guess it's hard to see red on red here, the minimum width of a poly uh, a gate uh, is 50 nanometer. Okay, so that uh, plays nicely with the fact that this is a 45 nanometer uh, process. The minimum length is well, it should have been 45 nanometer, but for various reasons, it's actually 50 nanometer, okay? And then you can see, you know, poly to poly spacing has certain rules. Poly has to overlap the uh, uh, active region by a certain amount uh, and, and so on and so forth, okay? So these are some of the, 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 the poly rules. If you go to the, the link here, you can go see a whole bunch of other rules for all the metal layers, the active regions, uh, the wells, and, and so on and so forth. So when we start doing layout, uh, you know, of course, we, we start by laying out individual transistors and then we have to build it up to, to larger devices like gates and then eventually larger devices like a collection of gates uh, and then even larger than that in a hierarchical manner. Uh, and what you'll find is that when you start doing layout, it can be very time consuming. Um, when you are unpracticed, I should say. Um, so, you know, it, it's a little bit of a foreign concept having to draw all these polygons. It seems like a lot of uh, low level uh, detailed work um, and, and that's true, um, but you really have to understand how this is done before we uh, reap the benefits of uh, some of the automated tools that, that we have available to us as digital designers. So in this course in lab three, we are going to be doing some hand layouts, some manual layout, uh, where we'll be drawing all the polygons ourselves. Uh, in lab four, we'll learn how to do this automatically. Okay, And so you can do this in a lot of cases for digital uh, processes. Um, it, it's almost impossible to do this for analog circuits. And so most analog and RF circuits are typically laid out manually using the techniques that we'll learn in this class. Okay, so instead of laying out each and individual, each and every individual transistor in a digital uh, design, um, it turns out that most digital designs tend to have a collection of items that we use over and over again. You know, we use lots of inverters, we use NAND gates, NOR gates, uh, as we'll learn later, we use flip-flops and, and other types of digital uh, circuit elements, okay? And so what we typically will have done in a particular CMOS process is we'll have, you know, some team of engineers just design a whole variety of these common gates that we use, uh, and they will put them in what we call a standard cell library. And effectively what that means is that we have uh, a bunch of, you know, commonly used gates, inverters, NANDs, NORs, flip-flops, etc. And they are designed in a standard way such that they're all the same height. The VDD and the ground rails are all at the same place. Um, if you place one cell right next to another cell, no design rules will be violated. Uh, there's regular uh, layouts in terms of we usually put the NMOS devices on the bottom and the PMOS devices on the top, although that's not strictly necessary. It's a good uh, practice to follow. Uh, and then we have good uh, ground uh, grounding uh, of uh, substrates and well contacts and, and so on and so forth. Okay, so if you do a good job of standard cell design, then you can basically take all these standard cells, instantiate a whole bunch of them and come up with a design uh, quite quickly. Okay, and so uh, we will leverage this uh, later on in lab four and hopefully also in your project. So let's take a look at an example uh, layout here. Okay, so what we're trying to lay out is an inverter. Okay, so the schematic of the inverter looks something like this. I'm gonna draw it intentionally a little uh, longer than usual. So we have a PMOS transistor connected to an NMOS transistor uh, with the input A here and the output Y over there, okay? So um, it turns out that this structure here uh, is a good model of uh, what's going on in our uh, physical circuit here. Okay, so this, this area here in the, the black box that I'm highlighting in red here, um, maybe I'll just do a little red highlighting here. This is the gate. It's typically created in polysilicon although in uh, more modern processes, they've gone, have gone to metal gates. Uh, the blue stuff is uh, metal. This is M1, 
Uh, so in other words, metal layer one. We connect to metal layer one through a contact. The contact comes, um, I'm sorry, I don't have a gray color here, so I'll, I'll use a, um, green here. The contact comes through um, the diffusion or the active region. And this is uh, N type. And uh, up here is P type diffusion. Uh, so that creates the, um, uh, the PMOS transistor. Uh, and the gray box here, this is what we'd call the N well. Okay. So if you take a look at this, we, we effectively have a, a, a gate uh, that on the NMOS side, uh, one of the terminals of that transistor is connected to ground uh, through metal one. The other side of the transistor is connected to output Y. Okay, so that's our NMOS transistor. Our PMOS transistor, it has a gate that's connected to A. One of its terminals is connected to VDD. The other terminal is connected to the output Y. So, so this structure here uh, exactly represents that uh, inverter, but now in a physical design, okay? Now, the only difference between uh, subfigures A and B here is that in B, we've added a tap to bias the well uh, for the PMOS device, uh, in this case to VDD. Uh, and we've also added a tap to bias the substrate uh, in this case uh, to ground, okay? Uh, so that is needed uh, all over the place for a variety of reasons, ranging from the latch up, which we may talk about later on in this course, um, to you know just making sure that our, our substrate and our wells are biased at a, a known good potential. So that was the uh, a simple uh, layout of an inverter. Um, this is a layout of a NAND3 gate. Uh, so again, we can uh, draw our schematic for a NAND3 gate. Uh, we have uh, three PMOS transistors in parallel. Here we go. And then three NMOS transistors in series. So this is our NAND3 gate. This would be output Y. This is um, a, um, actually, we can be a little bit more precise here. A is on the bottom, B and C. And then this is A, B and C here. Okay, uh, this should be connected. So what we see here is um, we start from um, ground. Uh, I'm gonna use a, a highlighter here. We start from ground, we work up over here and then we connect to node A. And so this node A forms a, an NMOS transistor. Um, we then have the drain of A connect to the source of B um, and that forms another transistor. Now, one question you might ask yourself is, uh, do we need a contact here? So in our previous uh, structure, we had a contact always between the, the source and the drain of the transistor. Uh, the reason for the contact is so that we can contact the active uh, uh, region, uh, the, the diffusion region, up to a metal layer, okay? In this case, there's no reason to take this node between A and B and bring it up to a metal layer. It doesn't have to be wired anywhere. It just has to connect A to B. So in this case, there's no reason to put a contact there. Uh, and in fact, as we'll find, it's advantageous to not have a contact there, okay? Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. So if we'll finish the diagram. We go through C, through B, through C. C goes to the output and, 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 and connects to node Y here, okay? Now the PMOS transistors, on the other hand, they're all uh, wired in, in parallel. So we have one uh, connected to VDD and its output then connects to, to, to Y. We have another transistor that's connected to VDD. Its output again goes to Y. Uh, similarly, uh, VDD output to Y, okay? So this layout again uh, exactly represents the circuit that we showed uh, uh, of the schematic on, on the left-hand side here, okay? Now, I understand that this may be a little bit of a foreign concept um, and this looks a little strange. Um, but I promise you, once you kind of sit down and think about this a little bit more carefully, it will eventually make a, a lot of sense and it's actually fairly straightforward. 
Okay, so on um, if we're doing quick back of the envelope uh, layouts to kind of get a sense of uh, how to structure all the transistors and so on and so forth, it's kind of a pain to draw all these polygons and be accurate with dimensions and so on and so forth. Uh, and so a, a quicker way to do this is with what we call stick diagrams. Okay, so stick diagrams are not to scale. Uh, we draw them with, with colored pencils, colored pens, dry erase markers, color chalk, whatever. Um, and uh, they're just kind of get a quick sense of of what's going on here, okay? So in this case, when you draw a stick diagram, first of all, if you're gonna use colored colors, which it's pretty hard to do it without, uh, you have to very clearly identify what each color means. Uh, otherwise, it's ambiguous and, and the reader may not be able to figure it out. Okay, so on the left-hand side, we have a stick diagram for an inverter. We've used blue to represent uh, metal. We use green to represent N diffusion, uh, yellow to represent P diffusion, and, and uh, black axis to represent contacts. Okay, um, so this is basically the stick diagram version of the inverter layout we saw earlier. We typically won't show the substrate contacts in a stick diagram. It's not um, strictly necessary. Uh, we understand that they're there. Um, and then this is the stick diagram on the right here of the three input NAND gate. Okay, now stick diagrams turn out to be a, a great way to um, um, ask layout questions on exams, for example. We won't have you draw a uh, full layout that's a little too difficult to do uh, on paper. Uh, and so if we do ask you to design a layout, uh, typically a stick diagram is, is the way we'll ask you to do that. So we can go ahead and, and kind of uh, start to create a more complicated circuit here. Uh, so this is a function y equals a or b or c and d. This box should be an and symbol. It didn't show up quite right on my PowerPoint. Uh, all barred, okay? Um, and so um, the, the right way to, to do this is probably to draw the schematic first. And then once you see what the schematic looks like, we can go ahead and take a look at the layout uh, and, and design an appropriate layout, okay? Now, one of the key uh, things that, that you'll have to consider is, you know, for, for a structure like this, we have some transistors that will share a ground terminal, okay? So these transistors over here um, will all share this uh, ground terminal and, and uh, do we want to place them right next to each other or do we want to have active regions share diffusion and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of questions uh, that we have to ask ourselves when we're optimizing our structures. Okay, um, so hopefully you'll get a better, a little bit better sense of this um, uh, through your exercises in your lab uh, and we'll also talk a little bit about how layout will influence performance uh, in the remainder of this lecture. All right, so before moving on to some circuit design, I just wanted to spend uh, just a few moments to discuss uh, the, the difference between uh, what happens if we add that contact between the source and drain region of two adjacent transistors or not, okay? So let's imagine we have a, um, uh, the source of a transistor here, we go through the gate to the drain of another transistor and we're, at, we're doing a series connection. So we have um, two transistors in series like this. Okay, so this is the source of transistor two, gate and drain. All right, now uh, just to be clear here, this dimension here is the length of uh, the gate of each of these transistors. Okay, um, and uh, the width uh, is just, well, uh, the width over here. Okay, so what ends up happening is depending on what the width uh, is, we have some amount of capacitance associated with the node at, at, uh, at this node. This could be uh, CSB um, or, or, or something like this, okay? So we'll call this uh, amount of capacitance K times C, where K is the uh, multiplier on the width of the device. Now we also get some KC capacitance over here. We have KC of capacitance here and KC of capacitance here. Basically everywhere we have a contact, we have some capacitance, okay? So the capacitance at the middle of this transistor here is 2K times C. And sorry, just for completeness, uh, W over W min is what we're referring to as K, okay? Now in this example, we, we have a KC of capacitance here, we have KC of capacitance here and we have KC of capacitance here. Now what we've done in this case is rather than having um, our diffusion region in, in example one here uh, contacted, go up to metal one, go across, 
contact back down to diffusion and create another gate, what we've done is just realized that, well, that's kind of wasteful. Why don't we just merge those two diffusions or, or, or share those two diffusions, contact up to metal in that way. Okay. Now, if we do this, we reduce our total middle capacitance from 2kc to kc. Okay, so that makes things a uh, little less capacitance, and as we know, having less capacitance is always good in terms of speed. Okay, now we can go one step further. Uh, of course, in this example, we have Kc of capacitance here, Kc of capacitance here, but in this case, rather than put the contact there, it turns out we don't even need that contact. We're not going up to metal, um, so why would we even bother putting a contact there? We could just merge the diffusions directly together. OK, so this will have lower capacitance than the shared diffusion. If you have to put a contact there and go up to metal, you're going to add more capacitance than if you just merge them. But to first order analysis, we're just going to say that it's about the same. So it's about KC. We know it's going to be a little lower than that. Um, but for first order analysis purposes, let's just assume it's, it's just KC. OK, now. When you are doing uh, analysis, uh, Elmore delay analysis, et cetera, um, in transistors, in this class, if we don't say anything about if we're isolating, sharing, or merging diffusion, then the correct assumption to make is to assume that all nodes are isolated completely. So in other words, we, we're dealing with the first case on the left here, okay? If we go ahead and draw the layout, or draw a stick diagram, then we can see whether or not we're doing shared, uh, isolated, or, or merged diffusion, okay? Um, so again, if there's no stated assumption about whether or not we are uh, isolated, shared, or merged, then uh, assume that everything is isolated, or in other words, fully contacted. We might use that terminology uh, through the course, okay? Uh, but if we show the actual layout, then you can see, oh, I can see there's some merged diffusion here, so we'll assume that it's a merged diffusion, um, or, well, because it actually is merged diffusion. Okay, so that summarizes what I wanted to do in terms of slide format. Uh, what I'd like to do now is uh, the remainder of the lecture uh, without slides, and we'll just uh, do some uh, uh, writing of material. Okay, so uh, what I'd like to start covering now is layout and design for speed. Okay, so I want to understand how we can optimize our designs and our layouts to, to, to really optimize uh, speed. Okay, so the first uh, topic I want to talk about is delays with contacted versus non-contacted diffusion. And again, by contacted, I mean a fully isolated versus um, merged or um, shared, okay? So let's go through an example. Let's design a NAND2 gate, or in other words, a two input NAND gate, okay? Now to do this, I'm gonna go ahead and draw a stick diagram, all right? So I'm gonna start my uh, VDD, a metal line up here. I'm going to put my ground line down here. I'm going to have metal come up. I'm going to make a contact. I'm going to have um, a um, diffusion in here, and I should be using a different color here, but uh, but uh, we'll we'll just make things uh, extra clear uh, in the labeling. Then we have a gate. So this will be input A. Okay. Uh, we can also draw the PMOS transistor. It's going to look something like this. Diffusion. There we go. Um, now, this is a fully contacted design or an isolated diffusion design. So we're going to contact to, to metal. We're going to construct another transistor over here. Uh, this transistor will have some contacts here. Um, these will connect together and this will be output Y. Um, and this one's gonna go to VDD and this is also going to get contacted over here. Okay, I guess we can put a solder dot there. Okay, so um, we've drawn the stick diagram. Uh, we should be careful to say uh, what the, the, the various uh, metal layers are. So this is M1, this is uh, diffusion, and we'll say this is P diff and N diff, just to be extra clear which is which here. 
Uh, the red is our poly gates, um, and X, the black X, is a contact. Okay, so now we have a good legend. We, we, we should be able to understand uh, what's going on in the circuit. Okay, so now that we have the layout, we can actually go ahead and draw our um, uh, representative diagram in terms of uh, calculating what speed uh, we're going to have uh, in our circuit. Um, so in this case, uh, we're, we're sizing our PMOS transistors to be of size 2 in order to get that good um, worst case delay that is about the same as our NMOS transistor. Uh, and then we have a similar structure down here for the NMOS devices. We have R over 2 of resistance for that first device, R over 2 here. I guess I forgot to put in the switches. There we go. So this is our switch model construction of our NAND gate. Uh, we have 2C of capacitance here. Uh, we have, um, oh, I guess it should be on the other side of the switch here. We have 2C of capacitance here, and then we also have another 2C of capacitance here for that NMOS, uh, for that second NMOS transistor. Okay, so if we go ahead and compute the pull down network delay here, we have to use our Elmore delay formulation. Uh, so first of all, we'll look at the output node Y here. We have 2 plus 2 plus 2C of capacitance, so that's 6C of capacitance, and that goes through a unit R of resistance, plus the internal node o over here, we have 4C of capacitance here, that goes through R over 2 of resistance, so the total delay is 8RC. So that was one way to construct the layout. Uh, there's another way we could have done it, so we'll look at an alternative layout. Okay, now in this way, I'm going to start in the same way. I'm going to draw my VDD and my ground lines, wires. Okay, I'm going to come up uh, through ground here, contact to an NMOS transistor. Oops. Contact to an NMOS transistor. I'll create that NMOS transistor. Uh, I'll do the PMOS at the same time up here. Sorry. Let's get these colors right. There we go. Okay. Now, for that second NMOS transistor, rather than put an X here, um, it doesn't make sense to do that because there's a series connection. We don't need to contact up to metal there. So let's not put an X there. Uh, and instead, let's just go right through uh, to the other transistor as follows. Okay, so this is transistor A, this is transistor B, uh, and we've basically just removed that contact. Okay, so we can say no contact. This is a merged uh, contact. Um, and uh, that, that, um, that helps us um, eliminate some of the capacitance as we'll see uh, in this circuit. Okay. Now uh, the other PMOS transistor, it's going to come up from VDD. We'll form the transistor there. We do have to contact that internal node here uh, in order to get the output out of our circuit Y. Okay. All right. So uh, again, normally you would label everything. We just did it in the previous slide, so I don't think it's necessary to, to label everything again. Okay. So let's go ahead and draw the uh, uh, switch level uh, diagram for the circuit again. So we have our two PMOS devices up here. Uh, now, how much capacitance do we have on this node here? Um, so we are actually uh, sharing, uh, let's make a note here, we're actually sharing a contact at the middle of the PMOS there. So we only actually have 2C of capacitance at the output. Of, of this uh, uh, structure. We don't have to double double count the capacitance effectively. Then we go down into our uh, double or a series contacted NMOS structure. R over 2 of resistance here, R over 2 there. Now the top NMOS transistor, it's of size 2, so it has 2C of capacitance. The middle node here is, is actually merged, uh, and so we also only have 2C of capacitance here. Okay, so if we go ahead and compute the uh, propagation delay of the pull-down network, 
uh, we see that uh, the output node has four C of capacitance that goes through R's worth of resistance. The internal node has two C of capacitance going through R over two's worth of resistance. And so this is a five RC delay. And this is much faster than the previous case. Okay, so lesson one is that good layout matters. Okay, it really does matter for good performance. If you're sloppy, you could have a fairly degraded performance as a result. Okay, uh, lesson two is, well, share or merge contacts whenever possible. So what we just covered are uh, techniques uh, related to layout that we can use to help improve the, the speed of our uh, designs. What I'd like to cover, cover now are other design techniques that will help uh, improve uh, speed. So other design techniques for speed. Okay, uh, the first technique I wanna discuss is input ordering. Okay, so let's uh, go through an example just to, just to analyze this. Okay, let's imagine we have a two input NAND gate. This is input A, this is B. We have our two NMOS devices on the bottom here. Uh, let's call this A and B. Uh, we'll size the gate according to the class sizing convention, so all the transistors of size two, okay? So rather than draw the stick diagram, what we can do is we can just uh, annotate some of the capacitances here. There's two, two plus two, which is six C of capacitance on the output node here. And if we assume fully contacted, i.e. fully isolated um, uh, uh, contacts, uh, then we assume there's four C of capacitance here at node X. Okay, so let me just make a note here. Uh, note, uh, assume, because we didn't say anything else, so we assume fully contacted uh, diffusion. Okay, now let's consider analyzing the circuit in uh, two cases. Okay, so let's consider two scenarios. Uh, that are functionally the same. Okay, so case one is when A goes from zero to one before B goes from zero to one. Okay, so we can draw a little timing diagram. Let's say A, uh, you know, is zero, it goes up to one, and then it stays at one. B is zero for a little longer, and then it goes up to one, um, and function, the output F here, uh, I guess we'll call this node F, um, is one, and then after a propagation delay through the circuit, it will eventually go to zero. Okay, so we'll call this the uh, propagation delay, TPD. Okay. Now let's go ahead and, and uh, compute the Elmore delay for this structure here. Okay, so we're looking at the pull down structure here. Um, when, uh, when node A goes high, um, we have a R over two worth of resistor that's connected to six C of capacitance. This is function F here. We have four C of capacitance at the internal node. Uh, and then we have another R over two that connects to ground, okay? So the propagation delay of this is uh, four C times R over two, that's for the, the node closer to ground, plus six C times R. So we get a propagation delay of eight RC, okay? So this is exactly what we had uh, analyzed um, in the uh, earlier example. So now let's go to the second scenario, scenario two. Let's say that B goes from zero to one before 
A goes from 0 to 1. Okay, so again, let's draw this timing diagram. A uh, goes from 0 to 1 a little later. B goes from 0 to 1 sooner. Okay, so F will go from 1 to 0 after some propagation delay. Now, what about node X? Okay, if we take a look at node X, node X was the node, uh, let's just uh, draw it uh, briefly here on the side here. Uh, this was uh, A, this was B, and this was F uh, going to the output. We said node X was right here. Okay, now when B goes from 0 to 1, node X was some some value we actually don't know what node X was let's say let's assume that it was the worst case and it was a logic one um, so it was a logic one as soon as node B goes high this NMOS transistor attached to node B turns on and so node X will discharge to zero right so we can annotate that it's it'll discharge after some propagation delay so let's call this uh, delay um, T propagation delay comma X for node X and then once node A goes high, um, there'll be some propagation delay to the output, T, P, D, comma, F. Okay, and this isn't to scale or anything, but it's just to, to, to represent what's going on here. Okay. Um, and so what ends up happening here is by the time node A goes from 0 to 1, node X is already discharged. Okay, so if we draw our... Um, switch level model here we have r over two uh, there's four c of capacitance at the internal node here we have another r over two uh, and this is f and we have six c of capacitance at the output now this is node x okay so by the time node a goes from zero to one node x is already discharged okay so what that means is we no longer have to consider discharging that capacitor here Okay, so what we say here is that TPDX is equal to 4C times R over 2. So this is the Elmore delay to RC of node X. Okay, so if TPD comma X is faster than the space between uh, A and B, then node X is already at zero when computing TPDF. So therefore, let's ignore it. It's already discharged. We don't need to include it in our uh, computation. So then what we can say is the, the fall time TPD F is just equal to the output cap 6C times R's worth of resistance. That's 6RC. Okay, um, so 6RC is, is faster than 8RC. We've literally not changed the circuit at all. We've just uh, carefully analyzed when the inputs are coming. Okay, so the lesson here is that the delay of the circuit is dominated by the input that arrives last. Okay, so therefore place this input physically closer to the output. Now the reason we may want to do that is because then if it's arriving last, it'll give a chance for all of the other impart, inputs to pre-discharge, for at least for the case of a pull-down network, or pre-charge for the case of a, a, a pull-up network, um, all of the uh, in interior nodes, okay? Then you only have to deal with the output capacitor uh, at the end, okay? So uh, if you're a clever designer uh, and you know that an input is going to be coming last, 
perhaps because it's the most significant bid coming out of your um, uh, adder or something like this, then uh, it probably makes sense to put that physically closer to the output so that all the other inputs that arrive uh, later um, or earlier rather will uh, pre-discharge some of those internal nodes. All right, so what we just studied is, is how, if, if, if we know the statistics of when nodes will, or, or edges will arrive into our gate, we can place them in the appropriate place. Functionally, it doesn't matter if A is on top or B is on top of that NMOS stack, it will result in the same Boolean function, um, but uh, we can potentially have some uh, speed advantages uh, if we're clever, okay? Um, so the other uh, technique I'd like to discuss is an asymmetric gates. Okay, so let's imagine the scenario where we have a NAND gate. One of the inputs is, let's just say input A, the other input is reset bar. Okay, now reset bar is rarely used and not speed critical. So is there a way that we could perhaps speed up A going through the gate uh, at the expense of perhaps slowing down reset bar because we really don't care about it, reset bar, okay? So let's take a look at the, the schematic of our uh, two input uh, NAND gate. Okay, so here's our two NMOS transistors and our two PMOS transistors. Let's put A over here and reset bar over here. This is the output. Um, now A will go closer to the output because um, reset bar should hopefully always, uh, uh, reset is normally uh, not active. Um, and so therefore reset bar is usually equal to one. Uh, and so we wanna keep that transistor uh, pre-discharged. So uh, for the same drive strength capability, we'll size uh, circuit A uh, to have a size of two, but because reset is very rarely used, let's just make it size one. You know, we don't care, okay? Uh, now, similarly, uh, we'll do something similar over here. We'll actually set the reset transistor to be very much bigger and the A transistor to be a, a little smaller than usual. Okay, so it turns out that that might be a little counterintuitive, but uh, but we'll see that that actually does does help. And, and the reason is, is because that reset transistor uh, in the NMOS branch is almost always on. And so we want it to have a nice low impedance but we don't care about its uh, capacitance because that capacitance is always discharged um, when A is, is, is flowing through the gate, okay? So let's go through and analyze the, the speed of the circuit. We have two C of capacitance on this side. We have uh, one C of capacitance on this side. Uh, for the NMOS transistor on the top, we have four over third C of capacitance. For the middle node X here, we have four plus four thirds C of capacitance at this middle node here, okay? So if reset bar is usually high, which in most normal systems, uh, that would be the case, then the propagation delay of the pull down network is gonna be equals to um, uh, four thirds plus three, so basically one over the size of the um, uh, trans transistors times C times three over four plus one over four R, which is equal to 4.3 RC. Okay, so as you recall, the, the best delay, even if we accounted for input ordering that we got before was six RC, but uh, by, uh, making the, the gates have a uh, preference to certain inputs, we can further reduce that delay. And the main reason for that is because we have, um, uh, we get to basically ignore that, that middle node here, which has a lot of capacitance. That's four plus four thirds C, it's pre-discharged, we don't care about it, okay? Uh, so the only capacitance is the capacitance at the output, uh, and then it goes through the amount of resistance that is equivalent to, to what we're used to dealing with in terms of the size of a single uh, NMOS gate. Another technique we can look at, and it's somewhat related, is a skewed gate. Okay, uh, and what we mean by skewed gate is that it will uh, favor one edge over the other. 
Um, so for example, maybe there's a critical turn on rising edge or something like this. and a less critical turn off falling edge. Okay, and as we'll see later on in this course, there actually are many practical uh, uh, scenarios where this uh, may actually happen, okay? So let's take an example. Um, we'll have a, what we call a high skew inverter, a unskewed, inverter and a low skew inverter. Okay, so let's start with the unskewed inverter. That's just, well, our normal size inverter. Uh, NMOS and PMOS, size one and size two. Okay, so high skew inverter, what we mean by high skew is that it's gonna favor the rising edge at its output. Okay, so what we say is that we'll have the same drive strength capability as a normal inverter on the rising edge, but we don't care so much about the falling edge, so why don't we just downsize that, that NMOS transistor? We'll give it size one half, okay? Now, again, how do you make half a size transistor? Uh, this is just for uh, argument's sake. Uh, you know, it's just a relative ratio, okay? So this favors the rising edge. Now, similarly, a low skew inverter is something that's gonna favor the falling edge. Uh, and in this case, we want that edge to, to be the, have the same drive strength capability as a normal inverter. We don't care about the rising edge so much, so let's just make that PMOS size one. Okay, and so this favors uh, the falling edge. The rising edge, in other words, will be much weaker. Okay, uh, so the next question is how do we you know, figure out how, how good these gates are. Uh, of course, you can just do Elmore uh, delay modeling. That will work just fine. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about logical effort for these devices. How would we compute the logical effort here? Okay, so now the logical effort actually depends on the edge. Okay, so now we have to say, is it logical effort for low to high or logical effort for high to low? Uh, in other words, it depends on the edge, okay? Um, so G low to high and G high to low are the ratio uh, of input cap to the input cap or capacitance of an unskewed inverter with equal drive strength so so far this is exactly the same definition that we've used earlier with equal drive strength for that edge and that's the the, the caveat that we have to, to 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 look at here okay so for example a high skew inverter up top there. If we want to compute G low to high, we have to compare to an inverter that has the same drive strength capability um, as that low to high transition. Okay, so what we mean is we have to compare to a, an inverter that has, uh, well, size two for that, that PMOS device, but it's an unskewed inverter, so the NMOS device has to be size one. Okay, so then we say G low to high is equal to the input is two plus one half of our current gate over two plus one for that unskewed inverter, that's equal to five over six. Okay, now G high to low, we compare to um, an inverter with the same drive strength capability for the falling edge. Okay, so in this case, it would be an inverter of size one half and size one because it's unskewed, right? So therefore G high to low is equal to uh, two plus one half over one plus one half, which is equal to five thirds, okay? So as you recall, the uh, logical effort of an unskewed inverter is always um, equal to one. 
Um, in this case, for the low to high transition and the high skew inverter, we get a logical effort that's less than one, and that's great. That's what we wanted. We wanted some advantage for that rising edge. But as a trade-off, our logical effort is now five-thirds for the falling edge. So we've we've lost on the on, on the falling edge. But that's okay. That's that's what we were uh, willing to to deal with, basically, right? Um, um, so the average logical effort, if you just average these two between the two edges, is five-fourths. Uh, and so what that means is, on average, uh, we have more effort than the unskewed inverter, but that's an okay, acceptable trade-off if we are interested only in the rising edges and we don't really care about those falling edges. So let's take a look at another example because uh, I, students often get a little bit confused about uh, how to actually do this computation correctly. Uh, so let's take a look at a low skew NAND gate. Okay. Uh, so we have um, our two PMOS devices up here, two NMOS devices on the bottom here. Now we're building a low skew gate, so we care about the uh, falling edge. Um, and so we'll make those NMOS transistors of size two, uh, such that the falling edge has the same drive strength capability as a uh, normal unit sized unskewed inverter. Now we don't care about the rising edge, so let's just make those PMOS transistors of size one. Okay. So for low to high transitions, we wanna to compare to uh, the following circuit. Inverter. So for low to high, we basically have a PMOS of size one in the worst case, NMOS of size one half. So therefore G low to high of our device is our input uh, capacitance is one plus two. We compare it to a device of one plus one half. This is equal to two, okay? So the normal logical effort of a unskewed NAND gate is equal to four thirds. So we've done worse on the low to high transition. What about the high to low transition? We want to compare to an inverter um, that has an effective uh, resistance on the down path of one, therefore the up path has two. G high to low is equal to one plus two over two plus one. This is equal to one. Okay, so that's great. Um, so on our, on our falling edges for our low skew inverter, we have a logical effort that is equal to one. This is less than four thirds, so therefore the circuit is faster on the falling edges. So that's great. The average logical effort is three halves, which is uh, you know a little worse than the usual uh, NAND gate that we might build, um, but you know that's uh, an acceptable trade-off because we are more interested in um, in the logical effort uh, of the uh, falling edge uh, rather than the average edges. All right, so another uh, uh, method of uh, speed optimization is combinational path optimizations. Okay, so the, the, the question I'm gonna ask, and I'm, I need a lot of space uh, vertically here, so if, if you are writing, uh, also leave yourself uh, space vertically in your notes, is which of the following and eight gates is fastest? Okay, so we'll, we'll draw them down. Uh, let's assume we're dealing with a fan out of four, uh, i.e big H in terms of logical effort is equal to four, okay? So there's uh, three different ways we could potentially construct an eight input AND gate. We could make an eight input, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, NAND gate followed by an inverter. That's certainly one possibility. We could also build two four input NAND gates and NOR the results together that's logically the same, versus we could also build um, four two input NAND gates, nor these results together, NAND these results together, and then have an inverter at the output, okay? So the question is, you know, which one's faster? Uh, I think um, 
at first glance, uh, unless you um, know a lot about this kind of stuff, at first glance, the answer may not be obvious. Okay, So fortunately, we have a very good uh, uh, set of tools that we can use to try and figure out the answer. And indeed, uh, it'll be, we'll be able to do this. Okay, And that tool, of course, is logical effort. Okay, so uh, we can go ahead and start writing down the logical effort expressions here. The logical effort of an eight input NAND gate. Uh, you can go ahead and just kind of figure it out, draw the schematics and figure this out. Uh, you could also look it up in the table, uh, but it turns out that you have eight series NMOS devices. So we have eight plus a size two PMOS device. Uh, over one plus two for uh, a normal size inverter. So it has a logical effort of 10 over three, okay? Um, the parasitic delay of the eight input NAND gate is uh, two uh, times eight plus eight over one plus two. So that's equal to eight. Uh, so we can say, oops. And then the other thing we need to compute is the logical effort of our uh, inverter here. Of course, G is just equal to one and P is equal to one. Okay. So then what we can do is we can compute big G. This is equal to uh, 10 over three. Uh, big B is equal to one and big H we said was equal to four. Uh, we're basically have a fan out of four, which means we are taking this circuit and driving four of the same circuit. So then what we can say is big F is equal to G times B times H. This is equal to 13.3. We set F hat to be equal to big F to the power of one over two. This is equal to 3.65. So delay, which is the sum of F and the sum of P uh, is basically just equal to two F hat plus, um, well, eight plus one uh, for, for those two P's here. Uh, and so that's equal to 16.3 tau. Okay. Now recall tau is in units of three RC. Okay. Just to be, uh, just as a reminder here. Okay. So that's option one. We have 16.3 tau of delay. Option two, G, uh, for this first stage is, uh, well, these are four input NAND gates. We can calculate that. That's four plus two over one plus two. That's equal to two. The parasitic delay of a four input NAND gate is two times four plus four over one plus two. That's equal to four. So that's for those uh, four input NAND gates. Uh, for the two input NOR gates, we, we know what the uh, logical and parasitic efforts are, uh, five over thirds and two, okay? So then what we can do is we can compute uh, G, this is equal to 10 thirds, happens to be the same thing as before. Big F is 13.3, also the same thing as before, which means that F hat will be same thing as before because we also have a two stage design. Now the saving grace in this design is the total delay is two F hat plus the sum of P. In this case, the sum of P is four plus one. Okay, so it's a little shorter. So our delay is 12.3 tau. So, so far this structure is better. Uh, and the reason for this is the parasitic delay of a large fan in device tends to be very long, uh, large. Uh, and so we tend to not like using really big fan in devices, okay? So let's go ahead and analyze uh, the, the, the final circuit here and see if it does uh, any better. Uh, the logical effort for our two input NAND gates is four thirds. Logical effort for two input NOR gates is five thirds. Uh, oops, that should be a logical effort of the third stage is four thirds and logical effort of the fourth stage is one. Okay, parasitic effort two uh, two for the two input uh, uh, NOR gate. It's also equal to two for the two input NAND gate again. And the fourth stage, the inverter, it's just equal to one. Okay. So G, big G, if you go ahead and compute it, it's equal to 2.96. Big F is equal to 11.84. F hat, which is equal to big F to the one over four in this case, uh, is equal to 1.85. Uh, and then we can go ahead and compute D. This is four F hat 
plus 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 1, and this is equal to 14.4 tau. Okay, so as it turns out, this one offers the best performance. Um, and actually, the, the four-stage design actually does better than the two-stage design with the eight-input NAND gate, uh, which is a, perhaps a little surprising at first. But uh, once you kind of understand that uh, the large parasitic delay of these large fan-in gates, and by fan-in, by the way, we mean the number of inputs, uh, that really actually does slow things down considerably. So I just want to uh, finish the lecture with some fan-in fan out uh, with a rule of thumb. Okay, rather than having to go to calculation like that every time, um, let's just create a rule of thumb. And, and just for, for clarity's sake, fan in means the number of inputs and fan out means the number of outputs, okay? So fan in has a linear term, linear delay term due to linear increase in junction caps Um, due to the parallel transistors. Okay, um, so as we start to increase the fan in, we get a linear increase in delay because we're, we, we start to have all of these extra transistors um, uh, connected in parallel. Now, we also get a linear delay term uh, due to a resistance increase. Uh, this is due to the series transistors that we have. So therefore, delay is proportional to fan in squared. Okay, so that's that's not great. <laughs> um, uh, we prefer that to, to not happen. Okay, uh, fan out. We have a linear delay term with gate capacitance. Uh, in other words, uh, we have delay that's directly proportional to the fan out. Okay. So then what we say is that delay of our circuit is approximately some constant times the fan in squared plus some other constant times the fan out, not squared, just linear, okay? So what do we mean by this? Let's take a look at a NAND gate, okay? Let's take a look at the propagation delay uh, versus fan in, okay? So we have a fan in of two, four, six, eight, et cetera. So this is fan in. So we have two input uh, NAND gate, et cetera. And let's take a look at the propagation delay. Now, it turns out that the um, propagation delay, TP high to low, increases quadratically with the number of inputs. Uh, it turns out that the low to high uh, doesn't, uh, it only increases linearly, and that's because of the, the, the parallel transistors, not the series effect, okay? Um, and so, Effectively, the lesson here is that we don't like building gates with too large a fan in because then we start to get this quadratic delay on our high to low transition, at least for the purposes of a NAND gate. It'd be the opposite for a NOR gate, for example. So the lesson here is let's avoid fan in greater than about a factor of four uh, in general. Okay, so if you are designing CMOS logic, I don't advise you uh, necessarily without thinking very carefully about this um, to build gates with a fan in or with a number of inputs larger than four. If you do, if you if you want to do that, it's probably better to just break it down into smaller gates with 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 more gates, smaller number of inputs. 
Now recall, when it comes to fan out, uh, a fan out of four is often is often uh, near optimal. And what we mean by that is um, the optimal logical effort we said is is somewhere on the order of uh, between a factor of, of three and four. Uh, we saw this in the in the prior lecture, uh, and that's effectively what what we mean by by fan out. Okay, so if we if if we want to design an inverter chain, we want to taper the stages by a factor of three or four, which basically means that we're effectively driving something like a fan out of four, for example. Okay. All right, so that concludes this lecture. Uh, in the next lecture, uh, we're going to start talking about various other forms of combinational logic uh, to create uh, an interesting uh, set of um, other logic families that we might want to use in some of our projects, for example.